Hi there, and welcome back to the Community Strategy Podcast. My name is Deb Shell. I'm a creator turned community builder. After launching my online community in 2020, I have a passion for online events and bringing people together. I now consult business owners and leaders just like yourself who have a message, their life's work, or a vision for helping others transform through their online courses, cohorts, or memberships. On this interview style podcast, you'll hear conversations with community leaders, passion for bringing people together online. Our goal is to provide you with interesting conversations to inspire you to build, launch, and grow an online community with energy, confidence, and purpose. Let's get started. Hi, uh, this is Deb. I'm just popping in here real quick to let you know, I'm giving you a heads up that this is episode 99 with Carrie Melissa Jones. In our conversation today, we talked so about so many things, um, her start in the community industry, the, um, her being with CMX and then leaving CMX, her starting out on her own journey, her travel adventures. And we talk about the challenges in 2020 as well as uh, in, in 2022, um, how it's been a challenging year for a lot of consultancy um, experts and consultancy is tough. So we talked about just the journey and how she's gotten to where she is today and um, what she's excited about for 2023. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm excited to let you know that there's one more episode left. Episode 100 will be the last episode of this podcast and for 2022. Uh, That'll be coming up next in your uh, podcast. But please uh, share this episode with a friend if you really enjoy it. And uh, I hope you do. So take care and I'll see you soon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us back here with the Community Strategy Podcast. My name's Deb. I'm the host here, and I am super excited to announce this is episode 99. It's crazy, long journey, um, but we're at episode 99, which means we got one more episode at 100. But today we're celebrating with Carrie Melissa Jones. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Community Strategy Podcast, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me, Deb. It's an honor, truly. I am thrilled uh, that you're here. And I was uh, telling uh, bef- before we started recording, I was I was mentioning to you uh, in the Fine Comb Here community, we actually did your book <laughs> for the uh, the uh, book club <laughs> this year, uh-huh. which was great. Our community loved it. We had lots of members who really enjoyed it. And so I just wanted to say thank you. I know you're an author, you're a strategist. There's a lot, lot that you do. So um, maybe start us off with a little bit about before we jump into what you're currently doing, what got you interested in the community space? Yeah. So I, it's something that I inadvertently got into, I think like a lot of people, <laughs> um, but growing up, um, I was just a really, I mean, if you've read the book, you know, this it's in the, in the very beginning, if you've read the first like 10 pages, you'll know this about me, but, um, I was a super shy and awkward kid. I had trouble speaking up for myself, using my voice, all these things. And especially in my teen years, I was just really, really lost. And, uh, you know, my family was going through a whole host of shifts and changes and, um, I didn't have anyone to turn to. So I was just burying my feelings and everything that was going on, uh, like many people do. And I was gonna uh, say, wait, that's been me all year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no shame in it. Um, but I had no one to, to turn to really. Um, my family wasn't necessarily open and talking about what was going on. And I didn't have friends that I felt safe to really share things with. I've never done it before, but, um, around this time I discovered online forums. And so, uh, I was, you know, 15, 16 or so and discovered music forums. I was actually learning to play guitar. And so I was like looking for guitar sheet music. And then there was like forums alongside these sheet music websites. Um, and yeah, and I quickly discovered that there were people who were my age, people who were older, younger, um, usually not much younger than 15, <laughs> just because of <laughs> like, you know, the rules of the internet. Um, but uh, they were sharing things much that went way beyond the music. Um, the music was the thing that brought us there. But, you know, we would share things that were going on in our lives. We would have uh, not just the forum discussion structure, but we'd share phone numbers and talk to each other on the phone. We did like these gift exchanges. 
Um, and so it was the first time in my life where I actually felt safe to share mm. what was actually going on. And through that experience, I learned how to do that and that it was safe to do so with people who could hold that with me. And, uh, looking back, I didn't realize, I didn't really recognize that as a major thing that happened in my life. But, um, as I entered my career in my early twenties, I just found myself con continually drawn to making relationships on the internet. I was like, I love people. I love being able to meet people all over. And actually I've been doing this for a really, really long time, <laughs> just naturally. And so, um, I discovered this was like in the early days of Pinterest and uh, Lyft and some other companies were investing in community really early on in their company strategy. And I met some of these community managers and they were just some of the most generous, warm, lovely people and just doing the most fascinating work, just bringing people together from all over. Um, and when I finally discovered that this was a job, I just remember coming home from a meeting with somebody I, I had just met at a meetup group and uh, just declaring, this is what I'm going to do with my career. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. This is it. <laughs> I found it. Um, so I feel very lucky that I had that realization and that kind of um, connection to the work. But yeah, that's how I discovered it in the early 2000s. Um, and then I turned out I've been doing it since the 90s. <laughs> that's yeah, that's so interesting. I, I can relate to so many things like that sense shared of um, having a safe space. I think that's yeah. sometimes hard and it's challenging for um, a lot of reasons, like in person, sometimes you just don't have that family or friend support, like yeah. in your actual physical community. And so that's why the online community space can like transcend your experience um, to be able to connect to people and, and then ha who have shared values or interests. Um, and I, I love, um, the journey and the experience there. Yeah. I can so relate to that with just my community experience and, um, yeah. And loving, loving the, um, experience of just connecting with others and seeming like that we're not so different after all kind of thing. Like yeah. I started, especially in the last couple of years for me, I'm newer to the global space. And so I've really built relationships globally in the last couple of years, which I never would have thought about traveling to like, you know, these different countries. And now I'm yeah. like, cool. I have like, if I decide to go someday, I, I know people. Like, I know which is <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I think about like my ancestors and what they would think about that. Like, <laughs> just wait, what you're, you have like friends all over India. You're going to like, travel. that's one of my travel plans is to go all over India and <laughs> visit people. Oh, I know. yay. Um, so exciting. Yeah. How but fun. Th that's actually a misconception that a lot of people have is that connecting online can't be as deep or, you know, as quote unquote good as um, in person. And it's just not true. In fact, there's a lot of research that indicates that some people, depending on their personality types, communication, apprehension backgrounds, they actually feel safer sharing online and sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, right. There's over disclosure and people becoming radicalized in spaces. But, um, in fact, for many people, it feels safer and it's easier to connect with people without the, um, face-to-face, many micro expressions, all this stuff, they can take their time, all that. And, um, in many cases, it actually can connect people more deeply than in person. That's so interesting that you are br brought that point up. So tell us about, um, so you decided you announced, you met some amazing online community managers. You got into this space. Uh, what happened next in, in the journey for you? So I worked for, um, I was working for, I thought I was going to be a uh, book editor. <laughs> That's what I thought I was going to do. I was going to move to New York. I was going to edit fiction books. Um, but I graduated college in the recession of you know 2008, 2009, 10, however long that lasted. Can't even remember now. Um, and there were no jobs in uh, book publishing. It's still a very competitive field. And I had interned for a couple of different like literary agents and found that it just wasn't the thing for me. And so I actually, I traveled, I lived in New Zealand for a year and just took some time and kind of figured out like, what am I doing <laughs> with my life? Um, and came back. I actually worked in textbook publishing for a little while. Cause that was where the jobs were at the time. And then, um, found out that uh, I was in California and there was a bunch of tech companies that were disrupting textbook publishing, disrupting education, um, lots of disruption <laughs> happening. <laughs> and uh, I went and worked for one of them um, at 
it was called Chag. It is called Chag. It still exists. Um, and uh, I was actually hired to simply manage relationships between uh, the company and content creators. But it became very apparent to me in the first few months of working there that what needed to happen was that these content creators actually needed to know one another. They were specialists in like physics and um, uh, complex algebra and, you know, like just all kinds of niche subjects. And, you know, some of them had like previously worked for Disney or like worked for NASA and they were fascinating people. And so I was like, I shouldn't be the only one that gets to know all these great people. Um, they should know each other. The company should know them. And so uh, I was really lucky. I worked with a lot of people um, at the time uh, who had been at Yahoo and understood from Yahoo Answers what was possible um, <laughs> when you build community, um, including the CEO of Chegg, who's still the CEO. He had been the CEO of Yahoo before its kind of demise and um, brought a lot of Yahoo folks with him. And they were just all about it. They were like, we get this. We understand what you're doing. Take what you take the resources that you need, make this happen. So um, that was an incredible job and just like such a rocket ship to be on at the time. What was the experience in India? How did that, um, was there any insights that you gained? Oh, in New Zealand? Or New Zealand, sorry. Yeah. Well, you said about <laughs> India was where you want to go. Yeah. New Zealand was where you spent. Sorry. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. So I spent a year in New Zealand and I went to Australia and I spent Christmas in Tonga. Um, and I went with my best friend from middle school, who's still my best friend. And um, I, I was actually just thinking about this the other day that um, even though I had learned a lot of social skills from meeting people on the internet, um, I had a lot of trouble going into like my first internship at a publishing company, like didn't speak with anyone. I was so shy. I would just go to my desk and just get the work done. And I was so nervous to even talk to the person managing me. And I was like, I'm miserable. This is not, I don't know how I'm going to navigate the working world. Then that internship ended and I went to New Zealand and I was thrown into a place that I didn't understand <laughs> and that I was culturally very different and uh, lived in hostels a lot uh, of the time and lived on farms with like families. Uh, actually, we did woofing, which is where you like go around and you farm for a little while and they they put you up in, in their home yeah. and feed you and all that stuff. And you work a little bit every day um, and you just have to talk to people like you have to navigate the situation. Um, and another thing is we hitchhiked the entire time, which I did not anticipate wow. we were going to do. And that's a, like, if you want to really quickly, yeah. <laughs> at the time we were like, are we really going to do this? We didn't tell our parents until we got home from the trip alive. <laughs> we said, yeah, we rented a car. We can <laughs> totally afford that. No, we had no money, um, <laughs> but it was the scariest thing ever. And I realized oh, wow. It's talking to people is actually really, really interesting. And I can talk to anybody. You can talk to anybody about anything. Um, and if they don't want to talk, then you learn that pretty quickly too. And that's, that's fine too. But, um, yeah, it just opened that up for me. Um, <laughs> and so I came home and I was like a lot more extroverted than, than when yeah. I left a lot more extroverted. Um, I, it even surprises me now thinking about it. So really, <laughs> it's yeah. so interesting because that's, so I went to school in 1999 is when I went to college for uh, photography. And then I wanted to become a photojournalist because I had um, been inspired by Martha Ryle, who is a, a photojournalist uh, that used to work at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and, and her work um, was just so inspiring to me. I'm like, this is what I want to do with my life. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then like, then technology happened. <laughs> um, and I went to school and got my bachelor's degree in photojournalism. And I was like, great, I can be a journalist now. And there's like no jobs and the jobs that there are, there's like no money. And, but I, I, I did it anyway. Um, but the biggest thing I learned when I got a full-time reporting gig and I was doing that um, in 20, 2009 is actually when I finally landed like it took me that long to like get a full-time job. Um, mm -hmm. But then when I was, when I landed that, I, I worked in newspapers from 2009 to 2012. And it was such like, you're talking about, like my editor was like, go talk to people. <laughs> if you didn't ask the questions, you're going to have to go back and ask the questions. So you better ask in the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And you get a really quick, you get a really quick cra- crash course in like how to talk to people and yeah. get out of your shell, which I really was still kind of, even though I had graduated from college and I was in my late twenties at that point, I was still kind of in my shell. And yeah. so that job, people say, oh, you're outgoing. I'm like, I didn't used to be. No, not at <laughs> all. Was, yeah. I was like the one that wanted to hide behind everybody else. And so I, th- I love the story because so many community builders are like, I'm not extroverted yeah. or I-, I struggle with this. And I think it's just a practice and it's just totally. like pushing yourself in that discomfort zone, yeah. you know, not all the time, but just at certain points Yeah, be- because then you just d- discover like people are amazing and <laughs> Yes, there's chal- challenging people <laughs> or <Yes>. challenging challenging <laughs> conversations. There's yeah. like not not nice people in the world, but there's also people who are really have your have the view that they do want to share their experiences with you as well as um, are interested in hearing about you. So yeah. I, I think that is a really great insight to share. And, and the challenge around just working and as in your, in your working life, but the way you described it is just interesting because I feel like the, we're finally getting to a place now where people are shifting that conversation of instead of how do I fit in their box? It's like, yeah. I, there is no box and yeah. I'm a person, a human being, and I have this one life and I want to use it in a meaningful, intentional way. And how do I do that and yeah. make a living and blah, yeah. blah, blah, you know? And I think that I love that about what you said, that you really connected to the meaning and the purpose um, in the beginning, what you said. And then that's what kind of guided you. Yeah. And I think, you know, your story too, I'm reflecting that. I think it's really important because I hear the same thing a lot of community managers say, I'm not extroverted. I'm very introverted. I'm very shy. And I think it's so important that we do not over identify with any personality characteristic that we think we have we're very flexible, changeable. Our brains are constantly learning new things. Um, You might think you're introverted today. And maybe that is like your energy, like where you get your energy from that that hasn't changed for me. I'm still very much like a, like to be alone, but uh, so much can change if you put yourself in new situations and uh, it's scary. There's no doubt about that, but it, it absolutely pays off. But the scary thing is, is, is where change happens yeah. and transformation. Yeah. Um, I became a river rafting guide in 20. <laughs> what have you uh, not done? <laughs> that's the, that, this is exactly it, right? But it's, <laughs> what is Deb not done? Let's ask. Um, but I, I became a river rafting guide because I fell out of a kayak and I got before I became a guide and I didn't know what I was doing. And I was with somebody who didn't help, like wasn't the yeah. greatest. <laughs> and that lesson, like that, I, I felt like I almost died, which I didn't, but I, it was very scary at the time to be in yep. the middle of a, a gigantic river and not have a boat and trying to figure things out. But like that experience of scaring me could have pushed me in a direction of I'm never going to go on it, get in a kayak again. Mm-hmm. Or what it did was it said, no, I actually want to learn. Mm-hmm. And so I took course, I took a workshop over a weekend to learn how to kayak. And the guys were like, Hey, do you, do you want to like be a guide? Cause they were like, they need volunteers. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, I don't know. So <laughs> I like started trading for six weeks. This is in 2019. That's what it was 2019. And I, <laughs> I became a guide over six weeks. I journaled the whole thing with like a, a um, a GoPro, like I had wow. a, a GoPro on it, but I was terrified every time I got in that water, terrified, mm. thinking I was going to die, thinking like, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing if I like fall out and I can't, and which happened. And like, I fell out of my kayak and like, I had a hard time getting back in and somebody in a boat, one of the guests that was in a boat was like floating by. I was like, you know, you should just get back in your kayak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's probably a good idea. I'm the instructor here. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, but just to say that like things are scary. So I I think that's so helpful for, for um, what I've learned is that the scary things every day, doing a little something scary or trying every once in a while to do something that pushes the boundaries of what you're, what you're used to really makes a change uh, long-term. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay. So we got, we got, what do we got next? So I know there's, we got to talk about CMX. Mm. Um, 
but I don't know where that is in the journey. So I want to make sure we, we keep yeah. uh, on track. <clears throat> I, can, I can give you the full context at a very high level um, to keep the story short. So um, I was at Chegg. Um, I was at the time I had been there for nearly two years and um, I entered into a very bad abusive relationship at the time, not something I ever thought would happen in my life. Um, and I started having like panic attacks at work and, um, felt I got more and more isolated. And so I, uh, went on medical leave from the job. And unfortunately the medical leave kept me closer to this person who yeah. was not completely toxic in my life, who was completely toxic. And, uh, <clears throat> I had to leave the job at Chag because I just couldn't. I couldn't, um, pick myself back up. And unfortunately I stayed with this person for a year and a half. And so, um, I got another job in San Francisco cause I was commuting before down to, um, Santa Clara, which is like two hours each way. Okay. Um, that's a so lot. I was like, that's a, that's a, big it was a lot. <laughs> I didn't mind it when, cause the, the train I could do work, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> well, no, but, but you, logistics are kind of important because it's part of the story. Yeah. And I'm, I'm falling apart mentally and emotionally. I'm like, I can't do this four hour drive every day. And so I was like, maybe if I work in San Francisco and don't have as much of a commute, like I can walk to work, it, things will be better. No, it's the toxic, toxic person that needed to be removed. But I, you know, I wasn't there yet. I wasn't like ready to, to go. And, um, so I, I worked not, at, you're a not job. alone in that journey. You are not alone in that journey. I know, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, yeah, I, uh, I got another job. I worked there for only six months because that environment was also not, it, they were not ready for a community. They thought they were in three months. It was very clear that they were not three months later. I was, you know, still in this relationship. Things were falling apart. It was a great learning experience for me, like to know, to see the red flags uh, when an organization is not ready, all of that. And also just not to push myself so hard. And soon after that, I finally I had support. I got support around me. I started reconnecting with my friends and family and got out of this relationship. And, um, so I didn't have a, a job for a little bit. And then I began consulting because at the time this was in what year would this have been 2013, I think 2014, maybe, um, there were a handful of consultants out there. Um, like Rich Millington was doing his work. Uh, the community round table existed, um, but there weren't a lot of community consultants and people who were, um, who could support organizations in this work. And so I was looking for another job, but every time I'd go in for a job, I would say, you don't need, you're not ready for a community manager yet. You just need somebody to guide you for the next couple of weeks or months and tell you what to do. And so I kind of worked job interviews <laughs> into consulting gigs, uh, inadvertently. Uh, That's was amazing. My plan. Yeah. <laughs> I started out, it was just a pretty bumpy path at first. I actually went on a job interview that it was very clearly they had no intention of hiring me, but just rather picking my brain. And so I sent them an invoice afterwards. <laughs> you are my rock star. Like hi, it did hi. not go well. It did not go well. This the founder but was pissed. To be bold <laughs> enough to do that, I would I like don't know how I'd ever have the courage to do that because I've been in that situation. So wow. Um I Amazing. can't believe I did it either. It, that doesn't feel like that was me. That feels like that was somebody else. <laughs> But, um, I think that was maybe my intro to like most, can I, can I swear on this podcast? <laughs> you can do whatever you like. Most people are full of shit and they will like, well, let's not say that. Let's not, I, let's, I don't believe that some people are full of shit and you can usually feel it. And when that happens, you need to use your voice, stand up for yourself and, uh, really just stand in your power for that. And I, I spent two hours talking to them and their team was just taking furious notes the whole time. And so I was like, those notes are worth tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, because <laughs> I just saved you like years of trial and error. Um, and yeah. you were not thinking about hiring me. So anyway, I was like, did that. <laughs> and then I was like, next time I do that, I'm going to get consent first <laughs> before I send the invoice. Send the invoice. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend anybody doing that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I started consulting. And um, at the time, uh, David had run, David Spinks um, had run uh, one CMX summit in San Francisco. Act and actually, um, 
CMX Summit was an idea created by Jen PD and Brett Petersell alongside David Spinks. And uh, David took the idea, did not include them in it, and launched the conference without them. So technically, there are three founders of CMX Summit. And uh, I didn't know this until about a year ago myself. And uh, so from the outside, though, it looked very exciting. And I was like, this is something I definitely want to be involved in. And uh, I went to the one in New York. And then after that, David asked if I would you know, consult with CMX, actually, um, as a content creator and, and a writer. And uh, so I worked with him for about four years, went from being a consultant to quickly realizing that a lot more work was needed on the business to turn it into more than just a conference that was kind of scrappy. Um, so worked on that for about four years and uh, learned a lot during that time. It was a very healing time in my life because um, I was coming out of this relationship that I was in prior, finding my voice again, finding my power. And uh, by the end of that like four-year period, I was like, I've way outgrown this. Um, I need to I need to get out of this uh, role that I'm in. Um, and so at that point, I took a sabbatical. Uh, this was in 2017. And then uh, I began consulting full-time. But even during the time that I worked for CMX, I worked on consulting projects part-time because it was so important to me not to get too abstract and theoretical about the work. Yeah. Um, it's so easy to just be a quote unquote thought leader and spout out stuff. That <laughs> that's not realistic. Like, yeah. That's not realistic. It's just like, you know, it like, it's like a truism that everybody knows. And you're just like acting like you came up with that thing. Like I would, I never want to do that. And um, uh, so it was really important to me to always stay kind of on the ground with people um, and so it was actually a really easy transition for me because I was able to say, okay, I'm going to take a short break and then I'm going to bring on clients and just really scale up what I had started to do part-time during that time. So, so many things that I, yeah, I didn't know the backstory. I heard through other people, the backstory on CMX, but, um, I'm newer. Like I met, um, with David actually at the end of 2020, because once I launched my online community, and then I like did this big push and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get members. And then nobody was going to pay me. And then I was like, oh, now what do I do? Um, and then people started reaching out to me and asking me to help them build their communities. And that was at this time that I was like, oh, there's a career here. And like, this sounds like something I'd really love to do. So I, I kind of entered the community industry in 2020 thinking like, this is amazing. Like if I could get paid and do this fun thing, how amazing is that? Um, and I quickly learned that what happened was I couldn't get a job. I struggled yeah. like so long. I kept applying, applying, applying to get jobs. And like, I applied three times for, to CMX mm. for an internship and got turned down <laughs> three times for an internship. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm 42 years old. I need a little, <laughs> I need somebody. I've like, I've got a lot of background and experience. I've been doing a lot of different things. I've been a creator for 10 years. Like yeah. I need something here. So what happened was, is I ended up getting clients. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and so, but what I struggled with was like, I didn't know how to do a consulting business. Like I didn't know what that was. And so yeah. that was kind of why I started the community consultants. That's the only reason I started the community consultants collective was Hey, is anybody else doing this thing? I yep. posted it on LinkedIn and asked, is anybody else doing this thing called community consulting? Because I can't seem to get a job in this industry, but people keep asking me to like build communities from it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of like how I got my my start. And it's been this like bumpy road. And consulting is a tough thing. Um, there's lots of ups and downs. Do you what do you think was like the biggest uh hurdle that you or thing that you overcame, like struggle or thing that you overcame through that process when you first started? Oh, there's so much. I feel like I overcome stuff every week. <laughs> Consulting is really hard um, and it's, it's not scalable. So you're just constantly learning things. Um, um, I think in the early days, what I, what I wish I'd known at the time is well, how better to price my services? I wish I'd understood that better. Um, Cause I would kind of, I think I just like threw out random numbers that were way too low. Um, especially just like speaking of, you know, power dynamics and, and gender dynamics and all kinds of things. Women typically tend to undervalue 
our work and the workforce tends to undervalue our value. So if we don't advocate for the value of our work actively, um, then we, we stay low on that. And it's really hard to ever make a, a business to support ourselves. So, um, I wish starting out that I had had like what you have, which is like the community consultants collective where I'd had other people who were navigating that with me, who were like two to three years ahead of me on that journey. Now I was very lucky in that I met, um, her name is Sarah Judd Welch. I don't know if you uh, know of her work. She is the founder of Sharehold before Sharehold. She ran a um, agency called loyal and she did community. She had an agency, a studio basically for community building. She worked with GE. She worked with Harvard. She's done some incredible stuff. Um, and I met her pretty early on in my community journey and she was a huge, huge help to me, um, in pricing in contracts, like giving me ideas for like pricing for retainers versus hourly and all this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think if I could go back, I would just charge more right off the bat because, <laughs> because the expertise is so rare. It's so rare, even though you might have like now 20, 30 people who are doing this work, that's still very few people doing this work for the I amount know. of need. I went to the community leaders Institute expo community mm-hmm. leaders. It's expo. It was in Memphis, uh, oh, yeah. in March of this year. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I would meet a lot of these consultants. And then when I met people, they were like, Oh yeah, I have a full-time job. And I'm like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. how are you doing this? And you have a full-time job. It's, it's in, insane, but yeah, there's not a lot of people that are in this space. It's very, it's very a new space as a consultant. Um, yeah. like, you know, CMX kind of established and a lot of, you know, the round table community round table established like this place for community managers and like training and understanding about what that means, but there isn't anything. And that's, uh, you know, that's the new direction for the community consultants collective for anybody who's listening, that is a community consultant and wants to, uh, to learn more about that. Um, we're going to be building out a website. It's going to be, um, under the, um, guidance of, Clock Tower Advisors, and uh, which is Todd and Nelson, who I've been working with since the summer. Um, but yeah, there hasn't, there wasn't anything like but beyond like what I researched, and then I met people, and then was like, oh, these are the people, and here's what you're doing. And then we've just been talking. But pricing is the hardest thing, mm-hmm. and I think you're so right. As a as a woman, we just we just are so <sighs> challenged with that in life, like in our careers as like when we're working for others in an organization, mm-hmm. and then when you go out on your own, you're like, so what yeah. do I do? Like charge like $50 an hour. Cause that's like five times more than I used to make before. Right. Like when I was making 10 or $12 an hour, like, right. is that what I do? No, that's no. not. <laughs> don't, do that. <laughs> don't do that. Everybody. <laughs> what I, but what I learned was, is I learned quickly by consulting with others that I, personally don't want to trade time for yeah. money. Yeah. Um, I recognize, like you just said, there's so much experience from like doing the things of building. And I've built over 50 communities now. There's like so much experience that you learn from your own experience. Cause I built my own and then from other people's experiences that saves people time and money. Mm-hmm. It's like, there, there's like a, a, I don't remember the whole story, but there's like a joke where it's like, you call uh, your light bulbs out, mm-hmm. a light bulb is out and you call, it's a special light bulb that you can't just replace. And you call the, the company and there's a, they send a guy and the guy comes out and replaces your, this light bulb and then gives you this, this uh, bill. And it's like when, you know, it's $999 and 99 cents or something. And it's like, you know, you're like, what is this? You just, all you did was take three seconds to change a light bulb. And, and they're like, oh no, like you don't get it. Like it, it spent me th- 20, 20 hours or 30 years or whatever, this amount of long amount of time to learn exactly how to yeah. properly remove and then install this specific kind of light bulb. Yep. Yeah. So the advice you're giving in a one hour call, that's the $999 (laughs) and like the $1 for like maybe the light bulb or something, but really it's, Mm -hmm. it's the knowledge that you gain over that lifetime of experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, I don't charge hourly for anything anymore. Um, and I, 
you know, every, everyone's business is different. So you have to think about that differently. I do know yeah. consultants that do, and it makes sense for them, right. um, helps them manage their time better and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I price things by value instead of by time. So I think about how much money is this going to make this company? Well, okay. I'm going to charge $50,000 for this. Great. We're right. done. <laughs> and, and, and did they say what? No, <laughs> they sign the invoice. They sign the contract and I get a deposit for $50,000 into my bank account. <laughs> but I have a team Quite now. Amazing. It's not just going to me. Yeah. Quite amazing. <laughs> right. Yeah. But if you didn't start there, but mm-hmm. it, to, to know that no. there's a, there's a progression. <laughs> yes. But, but just to say that there's options out there. So you don't have to, for consultants listing, like there's different ways to do things. There's yes. lots, lots there's of different ways. Way. And it's just a really good note to say what's right for you. Like yeah. what's right for me isn't necessarily going to be what's right for you or whoever. Like it's just really dependent on what's right for you. And that takes a little bit of time to really yeah. identify and learn about how do I really like working and how do I, who do I really want to work with? And then like you were talking earlier about saying no, (laughs) when it's just your, the red flags are popping up, um, you know, you know, in business or in in personal life, I just got out of a very toxic relationship that I had to like literally move out of my home because Mm -hmm. he refused to. And that just (sighs) happened in December. So it's been a year and I'm still kind of working through that process of like getting back to my voice and I'm writing a book, which is really an emotional, if anybody wants to write a book, think hardly about it. (laughs) Yes, I agree. (laughs) It's going to take you like, (laughs) some people are very fast. I knew a guy who would like go to Bali and write books in like two days. I don't know how good they were. I never read his books, but But, uh, yeah, to write something like from in here, from your heart takes a lot of time. Yeah. So you wrote a book. Um, tell us about the book a little bit, because I want to make sure we hit on the book um, and then kind of where you're looking forward to for 2023. So I think those are kind of cap us off with the uh, conversation today. Yeah. So the book is Building Brand Communities, as you know, um, co-written by uh, <clears throat> myself and Charles Vogel, who's the author of The Art of Community, which is just such a helpful and quick guide to community building that I know a lot of organizations use. Um, and so Charles and I teamed up, um, actually it was during the sabbatical, uh, I met him, um, and he was an executive coach at the time. And he said, I'll talk to you for two hours, like when you're ready to come back to work and we'll just, you know, I'll give you some guidance. It was, it was really generous of him. And so when I was ready to come back, um, from my sabbatical in 2018, I met with him and just had this very transformative kind of session with him about like the story that I mean, I'm, I'm able to do this podcast with you and tell you the story of how I came to be doing what I'm doing because of that conversation with Charles. And, um, he's just a very like perceptive and wise person. And so a few months after that, um, I had written a piece after working with, um, I was actually partnered with Sarah Judd Welch and we had been working with the American medical association. And I had written about some of our work with the American medical association and Charles calls me up and uh, is like, you should write a book. <laughs> I'm like, mm, no, that's like a 10 year thing. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, and he was like, no, you have a book now. You, pr- you probably have another book in 10 years, but like you have a book now. And um, also, if you want to write it alone, I'll support you. And that'll introduce you to my editor. Like, I'm sure they'll, they're going to love whatever you have to propose. Um, but if you want to write it quickly, we can write it together. And so quickly it was two and a half years, (laughs) by the way. Um, uh, so by myself, that would have taken me a lot longer. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we worked on the book, um, and his background is in, um, I mean, all kinds of spiritual community building. He's studied communities from thousands of years ago and, um, you know, traced kind of the principles that, that, guide all of them, um, the most successful ones anyway. And so we combined, um, that kind of big picture approach with my more like on the ground experience with, uh, working with organizations, um, that are making these investments now. So yeah, the book distills all kinds of principles for community building, walks you through a process for creating, you know, a strategy, but is really ultimately about how to bring yourself continually back to the relationships. Cause that's what everything comes down to are the, 
is the quality of the relationships that you're building. And those outlast any community you build and impact your quality of life and everyone else's quality of life too. And that's the kind of work I'm interested in. It's not just like building a forum for this tech company, but rather building relationships. And yes, they might exist on a forum, but those relationships are going to be like a continual web that gets built that creates a a better world for all of us and um, gives us people we can turn to in times of need. So yeah, that's what the book is about. How does that get received as far as that um, focus for the clients you work with? Is that a challenging thing to um, get to or to approach with them uh, when they might be focused more on how many members do we have or who's you know engaging or how can we boost engagement? Those kinds of you know questions. So my job as a consultant, I view it as like I have to pull people back out of that like small myopic thinking. Um, it's really easy to get stuck into that. And constantly just be worried about like, what do the numbers look like and all that? Like, I have a very detached relationship with quantitative (laughs) measurements um, in communities. I think it's important. Um, I think it only paints a little tiny piece of the picture. That's all quantitative measurement of social phenomenon ever is going to do. Um, And so two things to that. One, I try to vet out clients who that's what they like. That's the outcome they're looking for. Um, if I can't vet them out, I try to educate them before we sign of like, you're just going to take you some time. Usually it takes about 18 months for you to start seeing consistent engagement and growth and connection happening. So don't like, don't expect that right off the bat. And then the other thing about that is, um, there are, this is another thing Charles has taught me is like, there are leaders and companies and organizations that are really focused on things like winning and, you know, being the best and all these things, they're playing a zero sum game with what they're doing. And they're, I would say the vast majority of organizations are playing that game. And then there are organizations that realize we're part of this holistic ecosystem together. We all have to live on this earth together. We all rise together. And there are leaders that understand that. Mm -hmm. And so those are the type of people that I try to work with because playing that zero sum game, uh, we're never going to win at it. I have no desire to win at it. So I'm also not your consultant if that's what you're looking for. Um, but if we're, we're trying to create good in the world and ripple effects, and a lot of that can't be measured, um, then you also have to find unique leaders and, uh, projects that people are investing in that, um, that they understand, that that is, that's the game we're playing. We're not playing to win. We're playing so that everybody can benefit. So powerful. (laughs) So powerful because like, yeah, I get, I just had a call on Monday with a potential or with a client who booked a strategy session. He just wanted to know, how do I, how do I get to $60,000 a year with this membership community that I want to build? Mm. That, like that was where we started the conversation. And I'm like, yeah. well, here's some, you're going to have a hard <laughs> reality right now. Yeah. Um, I don't sugarcoat things for people on my calls, on my discovery strategy calls, because that's not going to help them. I tell yeah. them what's going to be helpful and meaningful. And it's about building relationships and getting two people to connect with each other uh, in a meaningful and intentional way that's purposeful, that makes mm-hmm. sense for them. Like, sparking that kind of collaboration and then yeah. just being just being gr- grateful that you can have that experience yes <laughs> I guess. well here's the thing about that it's like that's that's a question you can ask is how do I how am I going to make sixty thousand dollars from this membership program that I'm running that's a question you can ask I think there's a better question <laughs> that you can be asking which is more like how do I create a business that I love showing up for And that sustains me, which can be answered in a multitude of ways. And then if you really, if the business that you really want to build is this membership community is a community generally, then yeah, do that and figure out like where you're going to start pricing wise, start low, raise up over time. You never want to drop prices. That's not a good look. Um, And what, what I found even in my own business is that the way you think you're going to make $60,000 when you're at day one is not the way you're going to make $60,000 three years from now, the business model is going to shift. Your, 
you might, you might still have a membership community, but I have a feeling you're going to go into sponsorships and content creation, and you're going to end up getting, you know, paid to consult and to give keynote talks. So asking right off the bat, how am I going to make $60,000 from this business is a question that it feels when I hear it, I'm like, I feel trapped. I feel really trapped by that question. Um, versus like, how about we stay open and love the process? I don't know if you saw the, I forget the, what the movie is called, but it was, a, it was a David Bowie documentary, like all in his own voice. And um, it was too long, but it was, it was really incredible and beautiful. And um, one of the things that he said, said in that movie is like, if the process of creating art and you know, we, we can define art really broadly, but the process of creating art should not be a miserable process. This is not ex- an exact quote, but if you're not enjoying that process as you go, then the art is no good. Like it's going to be bad art. Um, and it can still be bad art if you're enjoying the process, but at least you enjoy the process. And any art that's worth creating is art that was created through a process of, of joy and openness and yeah. So I think the that, same is true of community and business building. That go- lesson, that lesson that you just shared took me 10 years to of doing my <laughs> photography business. I'm still really, working on it myself to, yeah. to learn because I started my photography business and creating artwork for others. And, mm-hmm. it, you know, didn't really, I didn't, you know, didn't enjoy it. It wasn't bringing me joy. And then when I let go of the business and I just said, I'm just going to take photos when I travel and post them on my blog. That's what I enjoyed. And it didn't make me mean I made a lot of money. I eventually got commercial projects that I didn't expect out of. I mean, my art works up in a convention center at a hotel here and in a hundred or two hundred and twenty five rooms and and stuff. But that's, Gosh. you know, didn't know that, you know, yeah. that was the path. So, like, I love the the just the recognition of the way you think you're going to make money as a business owner, it shows up so differently than what actually happens. And you don't, and nobody can give you the right answer to that. Like you have to have that experience. And I think that's just a matter of placing, giving yourself some grace and patience Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, maybe doing the side hustle thing or, you know, figuring out how other things are going to pan out for you financially. Um, so that you can find this like balance and and be able to experience the joy and the, and then, you know, hopefully be able to experience something um, more positive with, with a business going forward. But yeah, Um, future. So it's the end of 2022. We're going into 2023. Any um, insights or reflections that you want to share about this year and what you're excited about for next year? So this has been a really hard year. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, I thought 2020 was hard and it was, let's not downplay how hard 2020 was, but 2022 um, with, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and whatever's going on with the stock market and all of the uncertainty. Um, it's been really hard. And I think hard, a really hard year for community builders generally and hard for consultants as well. Um, because in times where people are afraid and they're just standing still, they're not, they typically start to close off and isolate, which is not an environment in which you can build a community. Um, and so I noticed like in February when the, the, um, when the invasion of Ukraine happened, like projects completely dried up like our inbound inquiries completely dried up and we're really like at a standstill. Luckily we had a client that was really steady through that time. Um, But they were at a standstill until about August for us. And everybody's experience of this has been different, but that's when I think people realize like, Oh, like life is going on and we have to keep continue to invest. And so I think um, this year has been like a year of a lot of stops and starts and uh, people, holding off, um, of investments and things like that. And I think for 2023, um, you know, I, I expect some more of that, frankly, especially among tech companies. Um, it's funny. Cause I know a lot of them have like cash reserves, but I, they're like, 
laying people off. <laughs> you know, it's like where I have, I have a mentor, um, her name is Juliana Stan, Camp- Stan Campiano, and um, she runs a, a learning and development consulting business. And um, she was like, where are the leaders like, um, you know, Howard Schultz at Starbucks in the early days who treated employees like they were the most valuable asset? Where are they right now? Where are they? Because we're just treating people like they're disposable. And I understand there was overinvestments made in 2020, 2021 with incredible growth in tech. Like I understand overhiring happened. This happened in many industries. And this is a little bit of a correction, but it's the way that this has gone down, the mass firings, (laughs) the Elon Musk uh, layoffs where people literally couldn't get out of the Twitter parking garage (laughs) because he had fired the HR person who had the key (laughs) to garage like like it's sloppy it's inhumane it it is the worst of corporate world of the corporate world and i think we're going to see more of that in early 2023 and i just i'm like really really hoping for some leaders to be more vocal or maybe i just need to look harder for them um who are standing out in this time uh, there will be major opportunity for those who don't stand still who do keep moving, who do keep investing in relationships. Um, Cause that's really the key to everything else. So I think for consultants, for business owners, times where there's a downturn are scary, but there are times of massive opportunity. And so we've got to get, hopefully, you know, in December and January, we can get a little quiet and reflect and just let things come intuitively to us and do like we did a bunch of research this last year and we're going to continue to do research from our customers next year and really be intentional about moving forward and just constantly trying new things. So yeah. lots of opportunity for next year. Being, I'm excited being and a, nervous. Being adjustable, flexible, and intentional about decision making. I think, yeah. And we didn't know that all these things, there was so many unknowns. And one of my clients was, you know, getting ready to scale up and, and, um, a year ago and, uh, the host of the, his name is Elijah Goldstein is the host of the mindful living collective. And he was going to start, um, you know, asking people to, for donations. And then he decided he has a global community. He said, no, I'm not, I'm just gonna, we're just going to keep it open and free. And, um, because people need this space now, like mm-hmm. more than ever. And it's just, it's, it's so fascinating. Like the transition of like, I had an amazing 2021 and then like thought that I was going to be like doing all these big things. And then 2022 came and said, hold on, Deb. (laughs) Just stop right there. The market's just just changing. So it's fascinating. And one of the things that I'm excited about with uh, my partnership with Todd and the Clock Tower Advisors is that he's working on talent led with uh, collaboration with um, Ilker who he and Todd met at the community consultant collective. And then through that meeting now have decided to start um, building a new offer. That's going to be supporting talent led communities um, in 2023, which is direly in need. Yeah. Like the talent space is just neat. We need, there's a lot of work there. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of work for every industry, every niche. Like there's so much community building work to be done. There's no shortage of work, which is why I always like welcome in anybody who wants to do this work. I'm like, yes, welcome in. <laughs> like if you're going to do anything unethical or inhumane, like we can talk about that as I see evidence of it, but welcome in. And then you can let me know <laughs> if, you're, yeah. if you're in it for the right reasons later on. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Thank you um, so much for giving us so much um, insights of your expertise and um, your, your, just your experiences are just very insightful. So I really thank you for uh, sharing today on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me and happy 99. (laughs) Yeah. Celebrating 99 episodes. So the episode previous to this one was with the CEO of meetup, uh, David Siegel. And um, I'm not going to announce the other one because I'm really excited about that, but um, this episode will be coming uh, this coming Sunday, and then um, we'll celebrate our 100th episode on the last Sunday of 2022. And 
for everyone who's listening, if you found this valuable, please share this with a friend, a colleague, um, if you're a community builder um, and, and, and you're just looking for some support, please reach out to either I or Carrie, because uh, like she said, we're, we always want to help other community builders and encourage them um, to continue building community online. Um, until the next time, I hope you're finding calm in this day, evening, moment, afternoon. Uh, today, it's Friday at 12 Eastern for me. Uh, find calm until the next time and take care. Bye. Hi, everybody. This is Deb Shell, and I am going to give you an update on the crowdfunding campaign that I've been working on for the last few months uh, for the book that I'm writing currently, The Creator to Community Builder uh, book. So this project <laughs> has been um, quite an adventure. The um, project started over the end of the summertime, and so we decided to kick off the crowdfunding campaign and when i say we i actually mean me so i have uh one person susie who thank you so much susie uh has helped me with the uh, content for the crowdfunding page and uh we kicked that off in september and then i i was gonna end it after two months but decided to continue um raising money uh to the end of the year so currently Thank you so many to so many people because we have gotten a little bit more momentum in the last two weeks and we've uh, raised almost $3,000 to date. So, um, and I'm happy to announce that I just signed the contract this week for the book designer. And my mission for the next two weeks, uh, for the last uh, few weeks of the year uh, of 2022 is gonna be writing this book. So, um, just wanted to give you that update. I wanted to share that. I wanted to thank all of the people who have helped fund this book, Grace, Robin, uh, Laura, Mark, Matthew, um, Mary Elizabeth, Pablo, Vanessa. There's so many more. Um, thank you so much for supporting me with this book. And if you are listening to this episode and you're wanting to support, there's a few different options on how you can do that um, best. And what I'll say is if you're on the podcast player and if you go to the show notes, you're going to see a link that would love it if you just said support this show and went over and bought me a cup of coffee. That would be great. Um, if, if you can't do that, no worries. Like just if at the end of the day, if you could share this episode with somebody, that would be amazing. Um, but I just wanted to let you know, I did sign a contract with the book designer. So this thing is happening and thank you for everybody who supported me as well as, um, updating you that I'm planning to have the manuscript written by the end of the year so that we can start having Susie, who's going to be the editor. And also, um, I have another person who's here locally in Pennsylvania, who's going to be doing some proofreading as well. So I've got. Uh, some support there for the Creators to Community Builder book. It's actually going to be, to just to be real, real crystal clear with you, I'm going to be sharing a lot about my journey as a creator, which is something that I did not know I was going to be doing when, when I decided I was going to write a book uh, a couple months back. I thought it was gonna, just going to be this practical workbook. And then I started writing a book and realized, oh, wow, there's a lot of stories that I have here to share about community building. So and creating and being a creator. So just keep on the lookout for updates on this crowdfunding campaign. Uh, and as we get into the pre-launch uh, in 2023 of this new book, Creator to Community Builder, thank you again, so many of you who have supported this and this podcast. Um, and as I mentioned in the episode here, I am gonna be ending the Community Strategy Podcast so that I can focus on writing and uh, making this amazing book happen for uh, you and hopefully many of your community building friends. So um, that is the update for today. And I can't wait for you to listen to the next episode, which is episode 100. I'm not going to share who it is, but it's different than who you might think. So uh, thanks again so much. Take care and see you soon.